technology or the new cooking utensils coming out, have you ever wondered how are these new things affecting Chinese cooking? If you do, stay on with us. Today we have Mrs. Thea Sportwell coming in to show you how to do a few really good Chinese dishes in her microwave oven. From the borderland between East and West, Honolulu, where fine Chinese cooking flourishes, join us in saying Aloha China as we sample a taste of the Orient with your host, Master Chef Titus Chan. So let us do the first dish. It's a green Chinese vegetable dish. We call it Gai Lan. Uh, also, we call it white flowered broccoli, simply referring to Chinese broccoli. Now, very simple and easy to do. Simply you cut all the, the uh, that part two away, then you do it that way. Then each stem follow with a leaf when it apply like that. Like this look very artistic. The leaf cutting it up, all like that. The flower is very good, so I want you to eat the flower as well. It's very tender, uh, a little sweet taste in the uh, broccoli uh, feel, yeah? In the family of broccoli now. On the stem, to get it cooked well, you should give a slender area. The more the slender area, the easier the heat to get in, making the vegetable cook faster, yet maintain the green look. That's the secret of cutting Chinese vegetable. Doing all that, cutting all up. Okay, we got all that in shape. Today, folks, we are very happy. Uh, we have my good friend Thais Bothwell come in. That's the lady, she's got a big heart and she's very well versed in microwave oven cooking. So, hello Thais. Hello Titus, how Hi. are you? Hi. Nice Hi. to see you again. Thank you. Thank nice. You. If I'm going to help you with the type of dish. of them. The first one is a hard plastic. It's a plastic. You don't yes. think the heat would melt it, huh? No, the heat melted. It works very well. I see. And then we also have a disposable paper container for people that don't have time to wash the dishes. Well, so, more like a TV dinner. Right. Kind of but it works very well. Uh, it's, it's usually used for dishes that don't require a lot of cooking. Oh, I see. And then we have the glass container, which is probably the most popular one that has a tight fitting cover. Right. So I think we're going to use this one with the, with the cover because we need to have a cover on this particular dish. We're going to do the vegetables and Titus, we don't season the vegetables on top like you normally do with microwave cooking. We, we put all of the seasonings in the bottom. Uh, why, why do you do that? Well, the reason we do that is that once the vegetables are in the bottom of, of the uh, container, all the moisture comes up on and gets onto the top of the lid and condenses and drops di down through the vegetable again. And that way, it seasons it very well. Oh, I see. So we're going to use the same ingredients that you use with your Chinese cooking. We use about, oh, about two, three tablespoons of chicken broth. And we're going to use about a tablespoonful of oil and a little bit of soy sauce, about two tablespoons, I think, would be about right. There For we go. the saltiness, kind of more or less leave it to any individual taste, huh? That's right. Salt and pepper to each individual taste. But mm -hmm. we'll just put a little bit in nice. here to 
see how it works this time. Okay, then we're going to put the vegetable in here, like this. And we put it in the cover on tight now. And we open our oven, putting it in. Now because this is a very quick cooking dish, we don't need to use uh, too much heat with this. But all microwave ovens are equipped with a panel here that tells you what kind of heat you can select and the amount of time you, you can use for each individual dish. Now, if you goof, it has a nice feature about it because you can stop the cooking and clear the whole thing and you can start all over again. Thias, have you ever goofed? Oh, Titus, I goof a lot. <laughs> you did, huh? <laughs> okay, so let's, we're going to eat, cook this particular dish for two and a half minutes. So we push the time cook, and we push two, three, zero, and the start, and there it goes. So what is the next dish you're going to prepare, Titus? Well, let's try uh, a pork hash. Oh. Right. Now, uh, this is about a half pound of uh, ground pork, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, then we take about uh, a little bit, oh, a fourth of a cup of chopped green onion probably would do the job. And then uh, maybe oh, half of a cup of uh, water chestnut, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, already sliced up. Better be real careful, otherwise I'd be a uh, oh, oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> Otherwise, messing up your kitchen. Just one down. Yeah, one down. But more to go yet yeah, over right. here. Yeah, chopping it up about half of a cup like that, nice. yeah? Yeah, some of them are the whole one, some of them already sliced, yeah. but whichever, it doesn't really matter much. Yeah, yeah. so once you get this uh, in, it gives you a chewy effect. Right. I, I'm sure you use water chestnut a whole lot too, Oh, huh? yes, I use them very much. I see. Then now, maybe we'll have a cup of uh, bamboo. Uh, maybe may it be the whole bamboo or just the, uh, this has been uh, shredded. They call it shredded, shredded bamboo. bamboo. Yeah, right, right. Uh, putting these two things in would make the uh, uh, pork hash a little more soft. Otherwise, when they steam up, they tighten. Get too yeah, tight. Yeah, they get, get too tight, too, uh, uh, too tough to eat. So I that's see. why we, we do it that way, right. Mm -hmm. So now we put it all in here, mm -hmm. right. Probably uh, to do the marinade, I think I probably leave it, leave it in here. Would, would oh. be a little easier, yeah? Okay. So we got to put the uh, taste in it. Mm -hmm. So I would say about uh, two teaspoon, huh? Soy two, sauce? Yeah, two uh -huh. teaspoon soy sauce, uh, salt and pepper. To taste, like what you say, right? Okay. Then we, uh, I need a little more oyster sauce. If uh, can you get oyster sauce? No oh, problem. Oh yes, yes. We right. No problem. About uh, two teaspoons should do it. Yeah. Uh, sesame oil, strictly for uh, a little bit smell. It would be good. Yeah. Uh, oh, Titus, our vegetable is all done. That's. One nice thing about the microwave oven, it tells you when it's completed. It rings a little bell for you. That so sounds good. We're going to take it out and see if it compares with your wok. When you're grabbing it, it doesn't burn your hand or anything? Not on things that have not been cooked too long. If it's, if it's an article that's been cooked a long time, then sometimes it does burn. But we'll just take the cover off here and oh, it stir it good. up a little bit. Here we go. And you can see if that's going to be all right now. Yes, uh-huh. Let me, yeah, thank you. taste? Mm -hmm. Is that as mm -hmm. good as your, very good. It is very crispy, just like uh, stir fry. Stir fry. One thing you should remember that with a vegetable like this, it should be served immediately because if you leave it set with the cover on, it will continue to cook. So we'll 
just take that out of here and you can get ready for the next one. It would discolor the, uh, uh, the vegetable. It yeah? would also keep discolor cooking. it, that's right. Right. So, okay, let me show you the rest, huh? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, uh, one teaspoon of sugar, mm -hmm. uh, optional. Uh, Cornstarch would be good, yeah? Mm -hmm. Like that. Then uh, a couple teaspoons should do it. So then, now, let me go back to here, would be simpler. Easier to put it down to, to okay. do the marinade. <clears throat> right. Do you use that own hand <clears throat> in the kitchen? Excuse me. Oh, of course, but I always am sh very sure that I wash it first, Titus. Did your husband uh, hell tell you to do that, or you do it just uh, on your own? I think I'm smart enough to figure that one out myself. <laughs> <laughs> how nice, how nice. <laughs> okay. We all do, yeah, in kitchen, you clean your hand first, you right. hot soupy water right. and, and all that. That's so sure. that's the basic, basic thing, yeah. Right. yeah. Okay, then uh, let me uh, wash my hands clean. Uh, up to this far, some people like to crack an egg in it, but that would be strictly optional, you know. Yes. So uh, like, like this would be a very good pork head. So this, that's your baby again. All right, Titus. We're going to use the same kind of a dish because when you're cooking meat, it requires a little more temperature. So we're going to put this in the bottom of the casserole here. And we'll spread it out nice and even. And then I'm going to stop this dish in when it's about half finished, Titus, so that I can show you how the microwave actually cooks, because then we need to stir it up and uh, redistribute it around the edges of the dish. So this time, we're going to use what we call a turntable, or a merry-go-round, or a carousel. And it's going to rotate the dish so that it will turn around and have an e even distribution of the heat for, the, for cooking the meat. Okay, now it's going to take <coughs> four minutes to cook this, so we're gonna press time cook again, four, zero, zero, and we'll start. Then when it's half finished, I'll show you why it has to be stirred again. Okay, Thais, now you know exactly what to do, yeah, what uh, number to push and, yeah. and all that. It's terrific. Uh, this recalls me a story. A yeah. uh, few years back, uh, when this thing first came out, I did a show, a television show for a live audience, like the high school kids and people like that. And there was a man supposed to do the demonstration. And uh, probably, uh, it's about the first few times he was on, so he was trying to figure in uh, how many minutes for a certain dish, you know, and, and what to push and when to turn right. the round table right. and all that. And then uh, when the control room called, you know, and they say, uh, tape rolling and five, four, three, two, one, the director says, action. <laughs> He got on the camera, he forgot what he was supposed to say, and he see a sea of young people there. So he starting to say, uh, uh, young ladies and young gentlemen, when I'm seeing you, that reminds me when I was a young lady and a young gentleman. Well, I think we're gonna take this out now, Titus. We'll push the stop one, and we'll take this out, and I'll show you why it has to be stirred. Amazing, every time you touch it, it doesn't burn, yeah? Yet well, the things are cooking it's inside. it's very good. Now you see how in the center here, right, it's, 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 it's still yeah, raw. It's still raw. Still yeah, raw. Still raw right. So we're going to mm -hmm. just stir this around and move it around so that all the materials in the dish will have an equal opportunity to get the same amount of heat. Right. There, that looks pretty good now. Mm, so we're going to yeah, mm -hmm. put that back into the microwave oven and we'll turn on the carousel and we just push the start button again and there it goes in due time you'll be done huh and oh, yeah. shortly yes right that, that's good now uh, Thea, uh 
let, uh, let me take the folks uh, go to the wild and see how the bamboos are growing because we've been using bamboos on some of our dishes. Yeah. I think it would be interesting, huh? Okay. This is a bamboo grove. When it grows up, it looks like that. It's a tree. When it was young, it would be looking like a shoot. If you're just sticking it up, take the dirt off about one foot deep, you're taking it out, it looks like this. Then you take the skin off, and this part, of course, would be very tough, a little bit on the tougher side. Then this part close to the tip, it would be very tender. So this part, you use it for stewing, and the tender part, you use it for stir frying. Now, there are different species of the bamboo shoot. Sometimes you take the shell off, it can be as little as one finger, which is very, very tender. While humans enjoy the bamboo shoots, the pandas from the Sichuan province, they enjoy the green leaves. So bamboo trees keeps everybody happy. When the tree gets old, it looks like this, and it dried up, and then with a little imagination, a little artwork, it turned out to be beautiful baskets like this. Okay, Tess, now that the kitchen is clean up, let's take a look how the dish look. Okay, Titus, we'll bring it out and see what it looks like. There we are. There's your pork hash. Does yes. that look like it should look? Yes, yes. Even the green onions still nice still and green. nice and green, aren't they? Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, since it looks so good, let's do another one, huh? All right, fine. Okay, we will do a, a pork with a daikong, or a, what do we call a daikong uh, here in Hawaii? White turnip. On the mainland, we just call it turnip, huh? It's a plain turnip, yeah. Plain turnip, <clears throat> right. So, uh, first thing, we got to cut the pork. Let's say have a pound of pork, yeah? Mm -hmm. Cutting it roughly about oh, one inch wide, one and a half inches long, a fourth an inch thick. That's the standard way of cutting, look, looking like right. this, yeah? Mm -hmm. this? No. Yeah, very good. Like so, uh, one can use uh, beef, it's just as good, you know? Yes. So, uh, it's more or less personal choice. Right. But then, if you were to using uh, beef, the main thing, you got to be uh, cut across the grain. Us, right. Otherwise, you got to jerk it out from right. your mouth, yeah? Very, very <laughs> okay. tough. Okay, then, uh, let me just, a touch of a uh, marinade over here sh should do it simply. Mm. A little uh, salt, a little pepper. Uh, I would give uh, a little taste in there mm -hmm. and uh, mix it up a little bit. And sometimes if we were a little too wet, too runny, a touch of cornstarch would yes. do the job. Right. right. Then uh, we have a vegetable as well, yeah. So I'm going to show what we have here and combine them together. Now this would just be a, a little bit carrot, maybe just about oh, half a dozen thin slice. It says carrot to make it look good. Right. We call it eye appeal, huh? Right. Okay, about half a dozen of uh, uh, round button mushroom. to give a good shape to contrast with the cut up daikon. Yes. About, uh, Oh, bite size, yeah? Bite size, right. right. That depends on how big that person's mouth is. How big the bite is, is yeah, right. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, this, of course, is uh, called young corn. Mm -hmm. You can buy it in a, a store, so putting all this in there, and a little bit of uh, bamboo shoot, should do it. Then uh, combine everything, yeah? Mm -hmm. And uh, salt and pepper again. Would you hand me a, a little bit oyster sauce and Soy sauce, please. All right. Yes. There you go. Okay, two teaspoons each of soy sauce and oyster sauce. And then uh, that'll be all yours now. I'm going to mix it up, and then you can cook it up for me already. All right. Okay. Very good. Right. Now, we're going to use this dish here. It has a cover, but sometimes you have a dish that doesn't have a cover. So we're going to use it with saran wrap. But first, we put a little bit of chicken broth in the bottom so we have plenty of moisture. And then we will combine all the ingredients together here. Right. 
down in there. There we go. Okay. And we're going to try and get the meat on the outside because the meat takes a little bit longer to cook. Okay. Now we take our saran wrap and we wrap it tightly around our casserole here. Mm -hmm. But we have to leave a little air vent here so That's that the right steam here, can huh? escape. Oh, right. I see, yeah. And then we're going to put it in the microwave oven. Right. Okay. Thank you. And we're going to set the timer for eight minutes this time. So it's time, eight, zero, zero, and start. There we go. And then the, all the meat will be nice and tender nice and all, yeah? Mm -hmm. And after that, it would look good. Now let's see how good it looks. Okay. okay. <laughs> This is what it would look like, Titus, when it's all completely cook cooked. Oh, yes, yes. It, it's just uh, very tender and all that. We can taste it and see it's it just right, that just many right. things. Just it's like you were cooking it on some other part, but it would right. uh, make a little longer time. Right. Uh, there's one more thing, though. Uh, this microwave oven thing is really good for uh, reheating. Yeah? Yes, exceptionally right. good for exceptionally reheating. Good. Yeah, right. So, well, I want to thank you, Tess, You're for welcome. coming up Hi. to our kitchen and show us all these good dishes. We hope to see you again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Slice a simple vegetable. However simple it is, it can turn out a beautiful pattern. For instance, you cut a firm tomato slice and then you cut it up like that and you twist it a little bit it would be sitting up like that then you put a little uh, green stuff to give a little support on either side it would be real good like that now the this is Chinese broccoli is white flowered it, the flower looks white. Then all you need to do, you play a, a piece and then cut this leaf small a little bit, putting it on the side. It would make a beautiful combination. So we remove this kind of thing and making it a little easier for us to work. Then over here, if you want to put a little more chopped green onion on the edge, it would look a uh, nice effect, but that is rather optional. Then another thing we are going to do, we do use a uh, turnip to slice it a few times as much as you want. And then uh, later on, it would turn out uh, looking like this, looking very, very pretty, soak it in uh, water. And then you take a uh, lemon slice, yeah, like that. Then you cut it up. Uh, cut it up like that, and then you you bend it, bend it a little bit, press it down, press it down. It would, it work. See, then you take a few pieces that turn up, slice it like that, then you backing it up a little bit right here. Now, then a little bit green here and there, it would help the uh, effect. It's just a, a very important effect to have a green here and there. Now that another thing we can do, we'll be using a little lemon, cutting up like that. Then you cut into like this. Right, like that, into the skin part. This, of course, uh, it'd be easier for you to work if you have a little bigger piece of lemon. So try to cho choose a big lemon instead of a smaller one. Probably go, should go back just a little more. Now, then go in there, go way in, go way in, and then Cut, yeah? Cut as much as, cut it open. This is a tough lemon. You ever seen a tough lemon before? Then you turn it and it would be looking like that. Now you can do one more like that. 
exactly the same and putting it one behind the other. A touch of green, it would be looking really good. However, folks, this may be very simple, but yet you don't have to have very fancy decoration. Sometimes you are so busy cooking, you really don't have too much time for decorate. Something like this would just be right. Try it at home and see if it works for you. On the next Aloha China, Titus provides the answer to today's interest in keeping fit by exploring steaming methods for seafood preparation. Poached whole fish, steamed perch, and Cantonese steamed prawns are the recipes featured from the cities of Canton and Shanghai. Steamed seafood, next time on Aloha China. Television special. James Taylor in concert. Don't miss it. The music of James Taylor, Tuesday night at 810. You're watching member supported public television, KTCA TV, St. Paul, Minneapolis, Channel 2. Today we're doing wedding dishes. Deep fried shrimp chips and sweet and sour pork. We also show you beautiful girls wearing beautiful traditional wedding dresses. Stay with us. Borderland between East and West, Honolulu, where fine Chinese cooking flourishes. Join us in saying Aloha China as we sample a taste of the Orient with your host, Master Chef Titus Chan. Deep fried shrimp chips are great for hors d'oeuvres, or we call it poo poo. They are so easy to make, very colorful, good for any occasion. Now, you can get it from a store. Uh, they are in a box, and then you put it out, it would be looking like that. Uh, try to buy the kind with a sorted color, so look more colorful, see? These are dried, then you got to deep fry it in a pot of hot oil, roughly about 400 degrees. Now, if the oil is not hot enough, it's not going to puff up, so make sure you uh, keep that in mind. Now that's here the fun begins, a little at a time, huh? Now putting it right in, and using your jowly, move it a little bit, stay away from it a little bit so you don't get your nose burned up. Ah, that's about done already, you see, very fast. As long as the oil is hot enough, and then that would be all what you need. It would stop expanding, and that's the time you take it out. Now, while you're doing that, all you need to do, you put thing in here and touch off the excess oil. Keeping the oil hot, another handful. That's a lot of fun right there. Stir it a little bit. See how fun that is? You can hear the noise. And it keeps that uh, once you buy it in a box, uh, the box you just leave it in a cupboard or something, then it would keep for all three or four months without any problem. Then, last, to do one more shot. Okay. Now, move it now, move, move. Move it like that. Now, it's stopped expanding already, so you put it out, take it all out like that. Again, touch off with the excess oil. 
Then one more thing I like for you to remember, because this is hot oil, before you do anything, turn it low so you don't get in any trouble. Now, we like to decorate it up a little bit. After all, this is for happy occasion. It can use a little uh, decoration. Now, see how easy that can be? Looking like that. Now, before we go into cooking another dish, let's just take a look at the fashion the guests may be wearing when they come to a wedding. Each dress would represent a certain meaning, expressing a wish, wishing the honoree happy thereafter. The first lady is Sandy Mill. Sandy is a former Miss Chinatown, USA. On her chong sam, the upper portion is a bearded dragon. Right around there is the cloud. On the lower portion is a bearded phoenix. It represents females and the dragon male. When these two meet in the sky, in the Chinese culture, it represents harmony. Sandy is using her chong sam to wish the honoree in their wedded life very harmoniously. Miss Lorna Ho, a former Narcissus beauty queen, Lorna is wearing the traditional one-piece garment. Her color is called high color mandarin color. The design on the top is half of a Chinese character means longevity. On the lower part is the other character of longevity. Notice her chong sam is got a slit on each side. The slit for a girl, it provides her with freedom of walking. For a man, it provides him freedom for watching. So Lorna is expressing a wish of longevity. Then here comes Wendy Chan. Wendy grows up in China and is an expert in Chinese culture. Notice her color is quite different from the traditional. The traditional one is high, but this one is wide. It's called Feng Xin color. And in her sleeves, it's rather wide and loose. And that is after the Qing Dynasty. Qing Dynasty is our last dynasty, started 1644, ended in 1911. So the outfit probably shortly after 1911. Now you would notice that she's wearing jade earring and that would make her walk very gracefully. The gold design on this two-piece outfit simply the symbol of a flower, chrysanthemum. And then all the button that she has, and it's after that flower. With this two-piece outfit, it represents good luck and happiness. Sweet and sour pork is a very delightful dish and it's so good to do. So to select the meat, you can select the shoulder, the thigh, or the leg, or if you want it to spend less money, pork butt will work. So you cut the pork into about one inch uh, in the size, yeah? roughly about one inch square. That's what we call about the uh, bite size, then you uh, put it in a bowl, and you do the marinade, give it a touch of flavor in there. So, all you need to do would simply be about, uh, in that one pound of pork, you take about a teaspoon, uh, a teaspoon or two, yeah, of sugar, and then uh, two teaspoons of soy sauce, uh, if you like to, maybe, uh, uh, two teaspoons of straight sherry uh, would do. Uh, give a little smell. And then 
uh, that would do it. Then you mix it up good. You use your hand, yeah? Now this way, it would get a little taste in it. Now in case some of you would like to put a little salt, that would be acceptable too. But nowadays, a lot of people don't want to use a lot of salt because in the meat itself, there's some natural saltiness in there already. So that part, we leave it up to you. Then, we let it marinate for a little while, then we do uh, a batter, yeah? A batter is made in such a way that for one pound of meat, you take two eggs lightly whipped. Then you put them in the bowl. This can be done night before. That's the beauty of it, yeah? And then you take one cup of flour. Ooh, ooh. Either way to work. One cup of flour, putting in here. Then this is the basic. After you mix up the uh, consistency, it's strictly up to you. You want it a little thicker, of course you are uh, add cornstarch, you want it a little thinner, then you add a touch of water or oil would do it. Uh, generally speaking, for home use, we do not recommend you use too, too much uh, uh, cornstarch, yeah? Otherwise, it can be a little on the heavy side. Now, something like this would be pretty good, but if you do want a little thinner, so a touch of oil, a touch of uh, water would do the job. Now, looking like that is very, very good already. So, we take all that away and uh, keeping the things clean. Then you combine the meat into the batter, yeah? Then again, mix it up good, like that. Use your hand though, huh? In, in your kitchen, you wash your hand very clean. The way that I suggest you do it that way is I want every piece of the meat well coated so that by the time you deep fry, the oil as your cooking agent go through the batter first, then get to the meat. Therefore, that's how your meat nice and tender and juicy, All right? Now, we need about four or five cups of oil, yeah? About 350 degrees, that would be very good. Every time you do deep frying, the temperature 350 is a very, very comfortable uh, deep frying uh, temperature. Now that you have the oil uh, condition, then you put the meat down, like that, yeah? Uh, uh, one piece at a time, slowly putting it in. Stay back a little bit, yeah? So stay back a little bit like that. Now go against the rim. Don't dump it in there, though. Dump it in there, you got, your, you got in trouble. So ooh, a little bit, one piece, at a time. Now, it's looking good, like that. Putting it all in, putting it all in. It's going to have a nice golden brown effect. You would need roughly six to seven minutes to deep fry that much pork. Generally speaking, when the pork turns to be golden brown and then uh, floating, then you are okay, then the pork is done. In between time, you stir it a little bit with your jowli or uh, spatula so that the oil temperature would be mixing up. Now, this is a little messy operation. We got to uh, clean our hands up quite frequently. Make sure the oil is okay though, yeah? Now I'm gonna turn it on a little higher, uh, as I say, roughly about uh, 350 degrees, it would be really good. Clean that up a little bit, let it be uh, flying there. Then we have other things to do. Sweet and sour pork is not a meat and vegetable dish. However, to make it look a little more 
puri, therefore we are using a little bit vegetable in there. Now before we cut in the vegetable, it's time to turn it a little bit now. If you would look at the wok, see how nice and golden brown it is right now, see? You got, to, you got to do what I'm doing now, picking it off. Otherwise, two or three pieces getting together is not going to be cooked. And then the pork, you don't mess around though, yeah? I want you to make sure that uh, the pork is thoroughly cooked. Six, seven minutes, fine. Now, move a little bit this way. The temperature of the whole wok of oil mixing up, yet the two fellows is sticking together. You are picking them up. We would need, this is of course uh, optional, yeah? Uh, all the vegetables, you don't have to use it at all, but it would add a little color, something like that. Then I suggest you use a uh, uh, half of a green bell pepper, cutting it up in bite size. Somebody will ask me again and say, hey, Tyler, you keep talking about bite size. Just how big? Well, <laughs> that depends how big your mouth is, huh? Then, Leave it in here, then probably you would want uh, one small uh, tomato, ripened one, cutting it up bite size again. Some people like to use maybe a cup of uh, pineapple chunk. Now, if possible, I recommend you use a fresh one, but for the time concern, a canned pineapple chunk would be acceptable. Now, we have to coming back here again. We got to do it, uh, keep doing this, yeah? Then we cut the veg vegetable a little more. Let's say we have a half of a round onion. Somebody will say, well, Titus, you got to be kidding. I'm not going to cut onion because every time I cut the onion, I cry. But folks, don't worry. With nowadays bad economy, you don't cry while you're cutting the onions. You cry when you buy. Okay, we got that all ready. Then now I want to show you one more thing which would be pretty interesting to you. Uh, that would be the uh, sauce, yeah? Now I'm going to uh, uh, stir it up a little bit more yet. Make sure the temperature is right. So, okay. To do the sauce in a bowl, you know, you in a kind of bowl should should do it. Yeah, two thirds of a cup each of water, light. Uh, let's say the uh, apple cider vinegar. Okay then light golden brown sugar. I prefer you use the light kind so that the sauce won't look too dark. That's why we, we use that light golden brown. Okay, combining in, in there. And then uh, maybe a third of a cup ketchup to add a touch of red in it. Mix it up good, yeah? Mix it up good. This is a... Uh, a little messy operation. The, for, to do this is a lot of fun, but yet a little more work to do the cleaning up. Now, some like it hot. A touch of hot sauce, any kind, to your own taste. All right. Then again, we got to uh, stir this up again and see if it were nice and cooked. Now, we mix this up really well. Mix it up good, yeah? Like that, mix it up good so it, it would taste, taste really nicely. Now, some people like to put a touch of ginger in there. Should the ginger is easily accessible, uh, it's not a bad idea that you use maybe uh, oh, that much, half a square inch like that, yeah? Then you simply crush it a little bit, like that. One time is not enough. One more time should do it. Dump it in there. Uh, later on, threw that away, though. If somebody chew on it, boy, I'm telling you. Then you need the thickening base. The thickening base would simply uh, 
two tablespoons of cornstarch to uh, four tablespoons of uh, water, mixing it up very well, yeah. Okay, I think the uh, pork is now done. So we take it out into a strainer so that the oil would be strained. And then you don't feel the oily effect so much. Then we pour off the oil. I want to emphasize on the fact that I don't want you to do, throw the oil away yet. Nowadays, things are expensive, yeah? So try to drain it and clean the oil up. I don't mean by using soupy water to clean it up. Drain a little bit, it'll, it'll do it. Then use the oil again, that's very important. All right, so we save all the oil. You know how to uh, clean the oil for sure, huh? I'm sure everybody have done that before. So now I want you to uh, heat the wok up. Uh, if you like to have a little oil in there, fine. If not, you can wipe it out. Then we put the uh, sauce in. Hey, it's smelling good. To hasten it to, to be boiling, so you move it a little bit. Huh? Now at this point, you can uh, make it a little, uh, make the fire a little higher. That is all right. Then we put the thickening in, put the thickening sauce in. Wait a little while, yeah? Wait a little while until it come back to a boil before you put the rest of them in. Now, this is what we call wedding dish. Traditionally, we use it on a wedding. However, nowadays, uh, the marriage in itself is a little different now. In the old days, people get married for better, for worse, until death do us part. Nowadays, people get married for better, for worse, until further notice. So, the tradition is going on, things are changing a little bit. Now, we are waiting for the sauce to come back to a hot boiling. Once it comes back to hot boiling, that's the time the piece of ginger should be out. Actually, Chinese eat this piece of ginger, though. But I don't think you folks like it that much. So for the safe sake, you threw it away. It's getting good now. So you put this in. I don't want you to cook it too long now, yeah? Simply combining everything in. That's all you need. Then because it's a, a wedding thing, so we want to make it look very, very nice. So uh, we decorating up a little bit. Then the sauce is now coming to a hot boiling. Look at this baby. Oh boy, oh boy, it's so pretty. Then all you need to do, putting it up right here, that makes a terrific wedding dish. Wishing the honoree be fertile. That's why we serve that, because sweet and sour pork in Chinese means tim xun, yeah? Tim xun means uh, wishing you have plenty of sweet offsprings. So this makes a good dish for a happy occasion. Cutting an apple swan is interesting, very elegant, yet if you grasp the idea is not necessarily very difficult. So you cut an apple, any kind of color that you want, then you cut up one more time. That isn't too bad. Then you use either a uh, uh, cucumber or uh, red lettuce, whichever you like best. Then you cut a stand. So by the time the bird is ready so he can have a nice overstuffed chair to be sitting on. Now 
here comes the, f the fun of the chopsticks. You place two chopsticks like that, then you beginning cutting like this. Wet your knife and first put a little water, a little vinegar to prevent from turning yellow. Now, all these should be done the same way too. Okay. Cut. You stop right there. Wet your knife. Cut the same length, yes? Stop right there and try to pull this away like this. Put it back. Now, one more time, one more time. Wet your knife. Stop where the uh, chopsticks is. Now, go like that and then try to pull it away. Uh, you, you just keep doing <laughs> you just keep doing that as many times as you can for that. It would be just looking like this, yeah? You cut one more time. Let us say for the time being we just do one more time and see how how it works. Okay, one more time. Now he's got his throne right here sitting him down, putting it right, right here, putting it right here. Then you use, uh, this one should do it. Doesn't, doesn't really matter much. Cutting up like that. We are to make him a pretty neck. Isn't that nice, yeah? So, this supposedly He's, yeah, that's the head. We are making the head for him now. Going way down, slowly now, got to use sharp knife. Touch up a little bit. And then uh, over here, do a little cutting. Like if he's got an eye, you got eyes too, huh? So cut it up like that, and then cut it up, and then put a toothpick in here, stick it right in. That makes a nice pretty bird. On the next Aloha China, Titus prepares a classic. Kung Pao Chicken. Eileen shares some thoughts on vegetable preparation. And Titus reveals his recipe for Mongolian beef. This is a very simple dish, yet it's very... Northern Delights, next time on Aloha, China. If you are enjoying Titus Chan's Aloha China series, Chef Chan would like to hear from you. Titus will send you a free copy of one of his special recipes in return for your comments on his programs and anecdotes about your Chinese cooking experiences. Please enclose a self-addressed mounting a risky operation to return them to the wild. We could go out there and put these animals back. They could be rejected. They could get lost. Join narrator Richard Whitmark for a science adventure story whale rescue. That's next time on Nova. A special edition of Nova, Tuesday night at 7. You're watching KTCA-TV, St. Paul, Minneapolis, Channel 2.
For more than 75 years, Crisco Shortening has helped provide good foods for your family. The beginning of classic Southwestern cooking, all vegetable, no cholesterol Crisco, proudly salutes the great chefs and foods of the West. Great Chefs of the West, brought to you in part by True Value Hardware and Weber, makers of charcoal grills, gas grills, and fire spice natural cooking woods. True Value and Weber salute Western chefs, masters in the art of natural wood barbecuing. There's a road headed to the west, and it's calling me back again. There's a pale blue sky and a north sunset. I can't forget when you go down home when the sun goes low. Head off the highway to the painted western sky. Walk down a worn path through the back door. Cooking in the kitchen and the kettle is warm. Then you sit down. Welcome to Great Chefs of the West, a video symposium of regional cookery offered by Chefs of the West and Southwest. This time, a special edition from the state of Texas, barbecue and wild game. Say hi to Junior, but do it from the inside of your car, which he's quite prone to kick dents in. He is one of the many transplanted animals called Texotics that have exuberantly taken to Texas Hill Country habitat. Imported 50 years ago, they, among other things, offer a new wrinkle in domestic game hunting. For example, this black buck antelope from India will cost you $1,000 plus if shot at the Y.O. Ranch. These animals also represent an attractive source of unusual meat to the chefs of the region. Like Lou Aaron, executive chef at the Sam Houston Restaurant, part of a Y.O. hotel property in Coopville, north of San Antonio. His exotic game pate is a good example of how young American chefs have merged local product with classical concepts. He begins by cutting saika deer meat. The saika is an exotic, originally from Japan. Yeah, that's the deer and the black buck. Right. Pieces of black buck antelope are also used in the pate. Yeah, these are the, the black buck <coughs> livers. Soak them in milk for 24 hours. Pork fat is also used. Here are proportions for the pate. Remove the processed pork fat, then process all the meats separately. It is not necessary to clean the bowl after each processing. The deer meat and antelope liver are pureed and the processed meats are seasoned and mixed. Okay. The seasonings include chopped garlic, seasoning salt, pepper, rosemary, thyme, basil, nutmeg, ground ginger, two eggs, sherry, and whiskey. This is fairly stiff seasoning compared to a classic French pâté, but the stronger game meats will more than stand up to it. After the mixture is thoroughly stirred, it is poured into a bacon-lined tureen. In another departure from the norm, the bacon has not been blanched first. This is usually done to cut down on the salty smokiness of the bacon, it but it does bacon. not adversely affect this redolent game mixture. Also, since this pâté is served cold, all spicing is considerably toned down. Bacon strips top the pâté before it goes into the oven. Cover, cover this loosely for about an hour, like that. And just pop it in the oven. Cover loosely with foil and bake for one hour at 325 degrees. Then remove That's the it. foil and cook another hour and a half. The pate should be refrigerated several hours, preferably overnight, before unmolding. Incidentally, almost any game meats will substitute in this recipe. 
or you can order the exotic products from several wholesale retail game cooperatives in the Hill Country area. But be prepared, they are not cheap. The pate is served on beef consomme aspic. Garniture includes garlic toast, capers, cornichons, and red onion. Another dish utilizing the Saika deer is a more straightforward, quick saute of tenderloin medallions. The tenderloin is trimmed and cut into three ounce pieces that will be lightly floured before sauteing. The medallions are sautéed in olive oil. Okay. Garnish will include julienned carrots and snow peas. The vegetables are also sautéed in olive oil and will be finished with white wine. Chef Aaron adds sliced chanterelle mushrooms and fresh thyme to the medallions. The pan is deglazed with port wine. Whipping cream is also added, along with about a tablespoon of lingonberry. Most home cooks will find them in jarred form with sugar. They are almost preserves or a jam, so be careful that the sweetness doesn't overpower the sauce. The lingonberries counterbalance, in this case, a very strong game stock reduction. Unless you take the time to do the reduction, use the berries very sparingly or omit altogether. Reduced beef stock may be substituted for the game stock. Steamed rice and the sautéed vegetables are served with the deer medallions. With presentation of medallions of Psycho, we leave the relatively antiseptic restaurant setting for more earthy environs. It's time to fire the grill for a Texas gem, barbecue. You'll find world-class barbecue from Kansas City to Chicago and from Memphis to the Carolinas, but it is, to Texas, what a crawfish boil is to Louisiana, almost indigenous. Barbecue has always been popular, but it is currently showing up in yuppie chain restaurants, a sure sign that something profitable is afoot. Great barbecue, like almost everything else, lies in the eye of the beholder. So screwing up courage, we began an unscientific and totally normative sampling of some sensational versions of the classic, beginning with the basic, Bo Woffert's beef brisket. He's a Texas native and a retired Air Force Master Sergeant. He now runs a Wyo Ranch hunting lodge in Buda, Texas. He also caters barbecue. As he introduces us to his version of brisket, bear in mind that real Texas barbecue is cooked over wood only, no charcoal. Bo begins by lighting the kindling. That all started since it's good dry wood. This is just some oak bark, and mesquite bark here that I picked up out there. He does not use charcoal lighter since he feels it leaves an unpleasant aftertaste. I have a little of this bigger wood on there. I'll just stack some more of this. Right, I got some mesquite on there, and I'll put a little bit of oak on it. Get a pretty good fire going right off, and then I'm going to smother it down once I get ready to put my meat on. He uses two-thirds oak wood and one-third hotter burning mesquite. OK, it's, it's in good shape. Okay, we'll get them seasoned up because I need about 20 minutes on the fire anyway. And all I use is salt and pepper. I don't put anything else on them because I figure we can put the salt on them. We'll get ready to eat them and that 
Some people don't like sauce on their barbecue. They just want the meat smell. I rub it in good, and that'll stick with it that way. The brisket is really one of the, probably the sorest cuts of meat when you get right down to it there is as far as for anything other than barbecue. It, uh, for years, they'd almost give you a brisket in, uh, in the meat markets, uh, but then people started barbecuing them and found out they was good, and they cost you as much as lots of your good cuts of beef do now for steaks and stuff because they, most all barbecue places use brisket. That's, that's about the only thing it's used for, but most all barbecue places use briskets, and, and like I say, it, uh, it's a sorry cut of meat for anything else, but it does a good job for barbecue. We'll put this on there once the fire gets hot. Uh, we'll put it on, and uh, we'll start it at a fairly low temperature on the fire because it won't have, have the time to get as hot as it, it will work up to. In a couple of hours, it'll be at as hot as we want it, and we're going to cook it about 12 hours. It, uh, uh, to cook a brisket, a good-sized brisket like this, it takes about 12 hours. And more or less, cook with, cook with coals and smoke is what primarily we want to do. We don't want to cook with much flames at all. And that's the idea here. If you notice, I got my fire way back in the back. And I don't want it, I don't want much fire right under the meat at all. I want to, I want to cook with a uh, heat away from the fire. And if, uh, because if you do, you'll, you'll burn them before you cook them. First thing I do is take that in. If you notice that crust that we've got, it's just a sixteenth of an inch thick there. But this is all just fat, so I just kind of slice most of that off and get the side and then start cutting it right on the very corner right there, just like so. We'll slice it right on off. And I can, I say any time that I do barbecue and if I've got this red ring, right here around it, I feel like I've done my job. Uh. Ignoring crabby liberationists, Bo allows one-fourth pound per person unless it's all men, then it's half a pound. Smells like barbecue. We'll take one more slice off of it. And anytime I serve barbecue, I try to slice it as I serve it, kind of, because it dries out awful fast. Barbecue sauce is not used during cooking as a baste, but is served on the side much more elaborate than, say, Kreitz Market in Lockhart, Texas. It's like a funny story that flops. To appreciate Kreitz Market, you have to be there. It began as a meat market in 1900. Today, Don and Rick Schmidt own it, but little else has changed. If you want sauce with your meat, bring your own. The reason is simple. When the Kreitz method of smoking was developed, barbecue sauce didn't exist. Beyond that, Kreitz offers a good example of Texas barbecue technique. At Kreitz, only post oak wood is used. They burn about 100 cords a year. It's started about 6 a.m. with kindling and some hot coals saved from the day before. By 6.30 a.m., the meat goes on and is ready by 11. The meats include a beef cut called clod, pork loin, Kreitz's own sausage, and boned prime rib. The clods are beef shoulder. 12 to 15 pound pieces are squared off for more even cooking. They are seasoned with salt, black and cayenne pepper the day before smoking. 95% of Kreitz's sales is shoulder clod meat. The homemade sausage is 85% beef and 15% pork. It, too, is utter simplicity. A grain and flour binder is added, and the sausage is seasoned with salt, pepper, and cayenne. After the rings are cased, the sausage is cooked twice. First, it is smoked in a small unit. When the sausage drips, it's done, then refrigerated overnight. The next day, it is put on the large pit and reheated for about a half hour. 2,500 to 3,500 rings are sold every day. But the shoulder clods go on first. Clods smoked the day before are placed furthest from the fire. The cooking is done over indirect heat. The smoke and heat are drawn across the meat by ventilation. The heat of the grill nearest the fire can get as high as 600 degrees. Hence, uncooked meat is started nearest the fire. The heat of the pit is affected by temperature and humidity. Rick Schmidt says that he only uses a thermometer in the pit when magazine writers or TV people come around. 
Usually, he gauges the temperature by the color and the sound of the flame. These cloths take about anywhere from four and a half to four to five hours to cook. So we put them on early. Later in the morning, we put on boneless prime rib and our pork to time them to get done somewhere around 11 o'clock. The pork loin takes about two hours to cook and the prime rib about three. Beef purists may be floored at the idea of smoking prime rib, but the finished product is delicious. Temperature control is achieved by moving the meat. The heat from the fire is constant. The proximity of the meats to the fire is the variable. It's an impressive juggling feat and one the Schmitz have obviously mastered. Another great barbecue house is the Salt Lick near Austin. It's owned by Hisako Roberts. Her late husband, Thurman, got tired of building bridges, so built a circular open grill instead and put Driftwood, Texas on the map. Tim Ader does most of the cooking at Salt Lick, and to contrast it with Kreitz's market, he uses only mesquite wood. This is significant since mesquite burns hot. His meat of choice is brisket, seasoned like Kreitz's with salt, black pepper, and cayenne. But at Salt Lick, pork ribs are also used, a little unusual in Texas where beef ribs are prevalent. We've always used the pork ribs here because we think that they're basically a lot tenderer and they have a lot better taste to them than the beef ribs do. They're not as large, they cook a little quicker. The diameter of the open grill was determined by Thurman Roberts' arm reach. The meat sits about three feet above the level of the wood fire and Tim Ada plays the grill like a Steinway. He sears on the hottest pot first, then rotates the brisket and ribs as necessary. The brisket is cooked 12 hours, then refrigerated overnight. The next day, it is put on the back of the grill and cooked another four hours. Okay, after the meat's cooked probably about 45 minutes, I'll go ahead and turn it over after the first side's been seared, and then we baste it. I'll go ahead and start knocking the coals underneath the, the brisket to Try to build up the heat under the pit, trying to cook it about 180, 200 degrees. Go ahead and get the smoke operating on the meat. The ribs had cooked for about 10 minutes and they were ready to, to be turned. A commercial sausage is also served at Salt Lake, but the most distinguishing feature here is their sauce. Once seared, the briskets are basted with it throughout the cooking process. Of course, since Salt Lick is so popular, it is axiomatic that the sauce recipe is a secret. It was invented by Hisako so Roberts. So I had to devise a, a barbecue sauce because barbecue sauce always has been served with barbecue here. And uh, uh, so uh, at that time, uh, being very frugal, I used to save all the pickled uh, peach uh, juices because they were so good. You know, it had cinnamon and cloves, and uh, it has the flavor of peaches. So in the beginning, I would take uh, oil and vinegar and uh, the peach juices and salt and pepper and add it. Then uh, we got to the point where I was adding more spices and finally ended up with more spices than, uh, than the colonel has with his chicken. Basically, the salt lick sauce is an emulsion, like a salad dressing. It is not heated, but mixed cold, and does not contain tomato. The color comes from paprika. Originally, Mrs. Roberts used the juice from pickled peaches, which suggests the key taste factor, sweet and sour. It's a remarkable sauce, and when poured over salt lick barbecue, memorable. Increasingly, young chefs are taking basic barbecue principles and translating them into fancier restaurant versions. Scott Phillip, chef at Las Canarias in San Antonio, is one. He employs the smoking process and barbecue sauce in a duck breast invention. He begins by trimming the duck. Much now we can take the duck, uh, place it in a brine. Brine consists of orange juice, 
um, water, salt, oranges, limes, and pickling spice. I'll bring this to a boil uh, and then cool it off. Um, if it sits for a day or so, the flavor will develop a little bit better in it. We'll place the duck in the brine. We want to submerge it. The duck should stay in the brine for about four to six hours before smoking. After the duck's been brined for a while, about four to six hours, we'll take it out and we'll place it in a smoker um, using uh, mesquite wood chips. Uh, it should smoke approximately about 15 to 30 minutes, depending on how hot your smoker is. Um, we usually run ours at about 130, 140 degrees, about 140 degrees. Once the duck is smoked, we'll take it out, put it on a roasting pan, and roast it 300 degrees for about half an hour. The chef begins the barbecue sauce by sauteing diced bacon. Next, minced onion. I had about one onion minced. A green and red bell pepper are diced and added to the onions. become a little tender, we're going to add uh, about five chopped tomatoes that have been peeled and seeded, about a half an ounce of garlic, once it's been sautéed a little bit, we're going to add about 24 ounces of apple cider vinegar. We're going to let that reduce down a little bit to about half. Add 12 ounces of honey. Thirty-six ounces of chili sauce. of tomato paste. Okay. About eight ounces of brown sugar. Four tablespoons of chili powder. Mix this up, bring it to a boil, and let it simmer for about one hour. Meanwhile, after the duck has roasted for a half hour, let it cool another 30 minutes before boning. We're going to take and cut on both sides of the breastbone, and both sides of the backbone. Take and try to separate the wing from the carcass. It's about an incision right about there. Something you just got to play with it a little bit on both sides. Okay. With your finger, you want to get in down to the carcass, trying to get the duck tenderloin and everything all together. And peel this away from the carcass, separating the wing bone from the main part of the carcass. And lay that on the table and just pull everything away from it. Okay, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to remove these bones. Take 
the wing bone, you want to carefully cut around it so you won't cut into the skin of the duck. And it'll pull right out. So there's no mark, no big cuts in the skin. Also with the thigh bone, cut on both sides of it, around it. Comes right out. Brush the duck with barbecue sauce. And since these are already cooked, place them in the oven for about five to 10 minutes to heat them up a little bit more. A pecan stuffing that features sponge cake instead of standard bread is molded for presentation. Sauteed green onions and pecans finish presentation. We hope you enjoyed this special Texas edition. Explore the excitement of more American cooking next time. Bamboo shoots, dice it out. Dice it out. Yeah, now put it in. The bamboo shoot in the can already uh, fully cooked, yeah? One cup water chestnut dice. Okay, we put it in here. Then uh, that's all you need for now. Put everything in here, mix, mix it up, stir, stirring it up. It is looking good already. Talk about hot stuff. Okay, this is what we mean by hot stuff. Red chili pepper. Slice it, yeah? Slice it, thinly slice, thinly slice. I want to show you one thing though. It's very interesting when you're talking about the Northern food or the Mandarin food. If you don't want it too hot, simply this kind of baby should do it. But if you want it really hot, hey, dump all the seed in. Wow, once you put the seed in, oh. Boy, okay, let us say, use a few pieces, yeah? Up to you, okay? Uh, to taste, All right? Then this is just about done now. The northern food is this way. The characteristic is this way. Cantonese food, you put sauce in there, and then you thicken it up. Northern food, you cook it a little longer, raise the heat so that the sauce pretty much dry up by itself. That's the little difference there. Now, then we have it all ready to go. The chicken is cooked very tenderly at this point. Then have a cup of uh, oh, cashew nuts or peanuts, whatever. So you put it in right now. Mix it up. Now you see that it, it's not very saucy. That's the characteristic. But if you want it a touch more sauce, that would be acceptable too. But mostly, the northern food don't like a Cantonese food. We just don't use a lot of cornstarch for thickening. So that's a part of the characteristic. And then northern food, a lot more meat than Cantonese food. Now, up to this far, a few pieces of uh, sliced chili pepper, you eat it or not, it would create a terrific uh, effect. Good for the king. In Peking cooking, as most of our Chinese cooking, a wide range of wonderful vegetables are used. The green color that we commonly see is from the pigment chlorophyll, but this green is very easily turned into an olive green by moist heat, by overcooking your vegetable, and by acids in the cooking water. So just do the opposite. Cook just until done, Abstain from adding any acidic ingredients as tomato sauce and cook with your pan uncovered.
Titus Chan has been stir-frying his vegetables, but if you want to blanch them, drop into a small amount of boiling salted water, keep that cover off, and cook only until your fork can first pierce that vegetable. In fact, let's do as the Chinese do and leave some bite or small core of crisp texture. Within this vegetable itself are volatile acids, and these acids will bring about the olive green color. If your cover is off, those acids will be released into the atmosphere in the vapor. But if the cover is on, those acids will condense on the lid and fall right back into that cooking water. The only time to use this cover is the very first step of bringing your water to a boil. Some cooks use the baking soda to try and retain that beautiful green color. But the two very bad side effects should make you put that box away. First of all, baking soda makes the water alkaline and your vegetables in turn will become either mushy or very slimy. Baking soda also destroys vitamin C, known as ascorbic acid and thiamine, B1. Animal sources contain the substance vitamin A, and this is in butter, and egg yolk, and also in the liver of all animals. In vegetables, however, there is no pure vitamin A. Instead, there is a pigment called carotene, and it looks yellow or yellow-orange, as in the carrot or in the sweet potato. If you eat these vegetables, your body would change this carotene, a precursor, into the nutrient vitamin A. Some vegetables mask this light yellow-orange color with the very dark green chlorophyll. When you buy your vegetables, choose the ones that are darker in color as opposed to those vegetables that have just a very light green. You'll be getting more vitamin A in the form of carotene in the darker than this. Every other day, you should either eat one serving of dark green leafy vegetables or orange yellow vegetables. One serving is either one cup if it's raw or if it's cooked, only a half cup. This is for your best health to eat this every other day. Now let's go back to Titus as he cooks those peaking dishes with those wonderful vegetables. Mongolian beef is a good dish. Take a pound of beef, either a uh, porterhouse tail or fang steak. Then you cut across the grain, slicing it like that. Then you marinate like what we did with the uh, chicken. So the wok is already heat up the same way. Two teaspoons of oil around the edge of the wok, yeah. A pinch of garlic, chop, dropping it in. Then you stir frying that meat. Spread it out as much as you can. Now, coming back to here, I like to explain a little bit about the vegetable. You may use about the, oh, half a green bell pepper, half a red bell pepper, or just a green pepper will do it. This would add a little color, that's all. Then we turn it one time. Now, stir fry a little bit. Then over here, uh, maybe a small carrot grated so that uh, it would be nice and fresh. Then you stir this up. Now, wait till the beef is about uh, getting a little cold. Then the pepper in. And then your kerosene. Then at this point, uh, optional, yeah? Two teaspoons of uh, wine. Smell good a little bit. Salt and pepper to taste. Uh, two teaspoons of soy sauce. And maybe a teaspoon of sugar. Then a touch of sesame oil, of course, optional. 
Uh, this is a chili paste with garlic. If you can find it, be fine. If not, no problem. One teaspoon should do it. Then you mix everything up. Hey, now smell really good. Then here comes the uh, rice stick. It's looking like that. The rice stick is looking like that. You simply use about a handful of them, deep fry in hot oil, 400 degrees or so, and then it would be popping up looking like this. That makes a nice base right there. Now, I must warn you now, this, you got to deep fry it with hot oil, otherwise it does not pop up. That is very, very important. Now, should you want a touch of red pepper, would, would do, but that's really optional. Otherwise, a little bit chili pepper, it would do. Now, the heartless part, uh, originally, it's a little bit on the hot dish, but then if you don't want it that hot, it's strictly up to your personal taste. So, that doesn't really make that much difference. This is a very simple dish, yet it's very classical, and Peking is very famous for this dish. So, here we go, a nice dish. Colored turnip flowers. Probably made your hand a mess. If you scratch, it can make your face as a mess too. However, it would make your food decorating up real pretty. So, take a turnip, uh, peel it, yeah? Soak it in water for a little while. Then you grate it thinly. Like that. You take about, oh, five or six pieces. Sometimes it doesn't come out good, then you don't use that one. It happens all the time. So try a few more, it won't hurt. Now, it should turn out nicely now, looking, looking like that, yeah? Then you take it out, piling it up good. This one seems to be very good. For, for base now, you see, this one don't turn out, hey, somehow you got some losers. Hey, this one is not too hot. Then, all pile, pile it up. Doesn't really have to be nice and neat, but it help to come back to the same shape, huh? Now, like that, and, okay, we save one piece just for in case. Now, so you take a knife, about half an inch, an inch from the top, Go way down, leaving about an inch or so. Then per cut, roughly a quarter of an inch. Don't measure it for goodness sake, huh? You are doing it for fun only. Then later on, you roll it up. Very simple and easy to do. Sometimes you don't even have to dye it. Just white would look very pretty. Now, we take this baby as the base, yeah? You roll it up like that, and pick it up from the end. Perhaps a little easier to do like this. Then you do like this. Pick it up. Perhaps from the stem, it's a little easier. Ah, like that, yeah? Put, putting up about midway from center, around here, about midway, yeah? About midway, like this. Pick this up, pick this up like that. Then, now, you see all shaping it this way, then you're beginning to roll. Easy now, make it tight, otherwise it get loose. And at times, if it doesn't roll, you get tough, okay? You say, you are going to roll. Then you roll it up good and tight, like this, see? Looking like a piece of flour. Then you skew it with a tough one, yeah? Round and hard toothpaste. Then from here on, you have your pick. We got different kind of coloring. You like it red, you dip it in red. Uh, that's just simply from the food coloring. Uh, you can pick it up from any supermarket without any problem. Then uh, let's say, uh, what do we want? Hey, let's try this one. Uh, 
this would be yellow, huh? Then you take it up, then you put it up on a pedal, then after you do a few finishing up, the finished product like this. A rare view of an old-fashioned noodle shop in the heart of Honolulu's Chinatown is featured on the next Aloha China as we watch a Chinese noodle master preparing the dough for noodle making. Then, kitchen, Titus prepares noodle dishes from Canton. Looking good. Putting it all Use your noodle here. next time on Aloha China. Tonight, Bing Crosby and George Burns join Jack Benny for a little song and dance. It's the Jack Benny Show. Remember TV the way it used to be with the golden years of television, tonight at 8.15. Titus Chan has written an illustrated hardcover cookbook as a companion to this series. To receive your copy, send a check or money order for $14.95 plus $2 shipping and handling to Aloha China Cookbook, P.O. Box 30764, Honolulu, Hawaii, 96820. Or use your Visa or MasterCard by calling 1-800-348-3500. Please have your credit card number ready when you call. When Bradley Ogden came to San Francisco to become executive chef at Campton Place in 1984, he had already made his mark with the American restaurant in Kansas City. There, he had begun expanding on a definite American theme using quality local product. His kitchen at Campton Place expresses this philosophy even more so, thanks to the incredible bounty available in California. His start of this time is a mushroom gratin, featuring three different types of wild mushrooms. The beauty about this dish, you can use any particular mushrooms that, you, that are in season. And this one we have um, chanterelles, um, we have shiitake mushrooms, and we also have Italian field mushrooms. So they look sort of similar. Shiitake are well, these right here. Italian field mushrooms are here. Italian field mushrooms, we just slice on about, slice them about a quarter of an inch or half inch thick. Shiitake, just quarter of those. Some of these shiitakes will just leave whole. I mean, the you know, chanterelles. And larger ones will just slice in half. And then we have um, some sliced uh, shallot and minced garlic. And we have chicken broth or stock and some heavy cream. Chef Ogden seasons the mushrooms with salt and pepper bit of kosher salt. And our sliced shallots. We'll I'll saute these for approximately five to seven minutes. I'm just gonna add a touch more butter to this. So here I'm lightly caramelizing the onions as I as I cook the mushrooms. And you want to add the minced garlic toward the end of the cooking time on the mushrooms. So as it won't burn. The garlic really permeates the mushrooms, so we're going to remove this now from the fire. Okay, and put it on a on a pan to let let it cool. Okay, at this point we're going to deglaze the pan with Madeira. And 
and Sherry. Let that reduce down to about half. And then just scrape off the flan from the bottom of the pan, which adds a great amount of flavor to your sauce. Again, reduce the uh, Madeira and sherry by half. Add your chicken stock. Bring that to a boil. Then add your heavy cream. And reduce this until it coats the back of a spoon. The way they coats the back of a spoon. And then we'll strain it through a fine strainer. Then we'll combine back our, our mushrooms. Now you can make this, you can do this early in the day. So I'll take your mushrooms off and make your cream. And then just combine everything back together again later and reheat it, adding a little bit of sherry because the sherry dissipates. So you want to add just a little bit, okay, sherry to it. And then we'll... The air crust of the gratin consists of finely chopped parsley, thyme, and basil. Other ingredients are... Some grated gruyere, Cheese, grated fresh parmesan, fresh white breadcrumbs. Mix this in. And then just fold this together. Top it with some the herb crust and place it underneath your broiler. Okay, still it's golden brown. And then just garnish it. A little sprig of rosemary. I can do this in a gratin dish as well for six or eight servings. And serve. When Gert Rausch came to Austin's Court Restaurant in 1979, he was one of the first classically trained chefs in the area. Prior to that, he had cooked in his native Germany, Switzerland, Montreal, and Paris. He made the jump to executive chef status when he immigrated to the United States, working in Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Colorado. Chef Roush loves the Texas Hill Country and avails himself of the broad range of fresh wild game in the area. His entree is a good example, Hill Country Mixed Grill. It includes breast of pheasant, medallions of wild boar, medallions of axis deer and rabbit backstrap. Put that aside. A backstrap of a rabbit, which also comes from this area. And also make sure that you take the silver skin off because it's a little bit tough. And it's really pretty easy. What you need to do is make sure that when you take a silver skin off, take the knife and lift it up this way so you don't cut, the, don't cut too much meat away. Also, boned quail with a cornbread stuffing. Salted, take a little pepper, put pepper on there. A little bag of salt. You put it in the pan. The quail is quickly sauteed, then goes into a hot 450 degree oven for 15 to 20 minutes. They glaze it just a little bit with butter on the top. And then you'll 
finish it off in the oven. About 50 degrees. For now. The bone pheasant breast is seared quickly, then wrapped with bacon. It's a little bit of bacon, and uh, because game birds get easily very, very dry, so it's nice to put a little bit of bacon around it. Three slightly different sauces will accompany the game. The foundation of all three is a much reduced pheasant stock. It is reduced to almost the demi-glace stage. The first sauce features three types of mushrooms, shiitake, oyster, and morel. The sauce begins with quickly sauteed shallots, then red wine. And some shallots. Sorted the shallots just for a little bit. A little bit of red wine to reduce. And then we add the mushrooms to it. <clears throat> and then we add about now the chef adds the pheasant stock. Note its color and consistency. And a little bit of heavy cream. Now we're going to reduce it over a very low heat until the right consistency. Now we're going to make... Also use a little bit of red wine for that. Just a little dash of red wine. A little bit of shallots. Some of, this, some of the venison stock. Lingon berries can be purchased jarred and usually with sugar added. The chef uses about a tablespoon of lingonberries. The third sauce is flavored with juniper berries. Put your knife and just press them up a little bit. It's more flavor to it. Red wine. And reduce a little bit of red wine. And a few shallots in there. And some of the, uh, the venison stock or game stock. Add the tuna berries. A little, some heavy cream. The sauce reduces slightly, and at the last, fresh chopped basil is added. You see how the pheasants and quails are doing. They need a little bit more. The boar oh, and deer medallions and rabbit will all be cooked on top of the food. stove at the end. The side dish is jalapeno spatzli, prepared by Chef Gert and his assistant, Bernd Boll. The addition of jalapeno pepper to the German classic was decided on the spot. Instead of julienning, the chef suggests pureeing it in a food processor before adding it to the Spetsly batter. The batter consists of one pound flour and 12 eggs. Chef Rausch says the recipe won't work if the proportions are cut down. Okay, yeah, let's just put a little bit of salt. And a little bit of nutmeg. Jalapenos. And now, since we have it mixed well, now we have to make sure that we get enough air underneath it. You just have to whip it like this. And when you see, when you see that there is like um, air pockets coming out, and then, then the dough is ready. Put the Pour in the water to make it wet. And then you add, then you put the dough on the board 
This is not nearly as easy as Chef Vol makes it appear. Even some German chefs can't do it. You have to, sh to shave it in, and then you bring it to a boil. It can also be done by forcing the batter through a colander or potato ricer. Because it's looking about as easy as it looks. And then you have on the side some water, some ice water. And as soon as they're boiled off and cooked off, you will take the spatzli and put it in the ice water and let it cool down for a minute. The spetsli is boiled in salted water for about two minutes, then doused in ice water and sautéed in butter before service. The remaining meat is prepared. The rabbit backstrap is seasoned with salt and pepper and sautéed. The deer and wild boar are seasoned and will also be sautéed, though much more quickly than the rabbit. Our venison and our boar. And this takes only it's just a very, very minute, not even a minute. The cooking instructions are for fairly rare meat. Adjust cooking time to your preference. The quail has been halved and the rabbit is cut into medallions. The pheasant and rabbit are napped in the lingonberry flavored sauce. Juniper sauce with basil is for the quail. Oh, quail. Finally, the wild mushroom sauce for the boar and axis deer. The spetsli is quickly tossed in butter. name is not an accident. It refers to the Mexican border and some of the most inventive Mexican food in Los Angeles is offered by chef owners Susan Fenniger and Mary Sue Millican. They are energetic and resourceful and have never dodged the dirty work in the often all-male kitchens they trained in. The menu in their two Los Angeles restaurants remains fresh as a result of working trips into Mexico, like their dessert this time, red yam flan. For the red yam flan, we have uh, 16 eggs and four egg yolks, which help make it a little richer. And we, <clears throat> we don't want to really uh, put too much air into it, so we mix it all sort of slowly. Two cans of sweetened condensed milk. And what we have here is uh, sugar caramelizing. And one of the things you want to be careful about when you're caramelizing sugar is that the sugar is clean pot it goes into is clean and that the water is not boiling too hard so that you end up with sugar crystals on the side. This, even this little bit here, you take chance of crystallization in the pot. So what you want is that you have water and sugar mixed together with your hands and so that the sugar dissolves, put into the pot and just enough water in there so that the sugars dissolve. And you want to have two, we're using two aluminum pans that are dry and clean of anything and ready to, they need to be ready to go. So as soon as this gets to the right point of caramelization, they can pour right into the pans. And the way you can really tell is by the smell of the caramel when it's all turned. So we add cream in half and half, and then... No serrano chilies. No. That can come right in. Yeah. All spice and cinnamon and all nutmeg. And sweet potatoes. We have three cups of red yam puree, which the way we make it is we roast, we put the yams in a 325 degree oven for about an hour and, or an hour and a half, it depends on how thick they are, until they're soft all the way through. Then let them cool, peel them, and puree them real simply in a Cuisinart, but not, not using too much motion so the starch won't come out in them. So one, you can use, if you, if you can't get 
yams, the red yams year round. You can always use canned, but I think it's probably, what, what we think is that if you can actually roast these potatoes, you get more of a caramelized sugar flavor than you do out of a canned potato. But if rather than use a sweet potato, which is much starchier and not nearly as flavorful, it would be better probably to use mm -hmm. a canned yam. Right. When the caramel sets up or hardens, strain the yam mixture. And once we pour it through a sieve, that usually makes ensures that it's a nice, smooth flan. So you want to put on a water bath any in any pan. It's water that's going to come about halfway up the sides of the flan pan. Bring it to a boil first, and then we're going to put the pan in and then into the oven. If you put it, if you put the flan into cold water and in the oven, it takes. Uh, quite a bit longer for it actually to cook than if it goes into boiling water. But then when it's in the oven, you want to make sure that it isn't boiling because then it's cooking too fast and you'll end up with scrambled eggs on the side of the flan. And what you'll see when you have an overcooked flan is holes. All, as you make the cut, there's holes all on the outside of the flan and then throughout the center of the flan too. It's, it means overcooked. that it's overcooked or that it's cooked too fast and too hot and into the pan, and it doesn't need to have, it could have a little bit more water than that, but then you add the flan pans in, bring it back to a boil, and into a 325 degree oven. Yeah. The flan bakes one hour, is cooled, then unmolded by first breaking the seal with a sharp knife. You just need to make, you push it a little bit more to release so that Get the some air, air under there. It will be comforting to home cooks that perfection does not Ooh. prevail, even in professional kitchens. Hmm. A quick fix is called for. You just have to try and replace the pieces. And test your skills as a puzzle. Puzzle. <laughs> pieces that you cut out first and then show the half cut flan. Homestyle cooking comes from the State Fair of Texas and Mrs. Charlotte Parks. She learned to cook from an aunt and her stepmother and must have been a good student. She won the first State Fair contest she entered and has competed in many other culinary events throughout the state. A winner this time is a southern gem, pecan pie. We're here to make a pecan pie. I'm first starting with my flour, and I'm uh, adding a half a teaspoon of salt and uh, two cups of flour. That's Charlotte cuts three-fourths cup shortening into the flour with a pastry blender. And just go in and whip me up a pecan pie any time I want to. Be sure when you're mixing your, your shortening that you blend it very well because if you don't, you're, it will have spots in it that will cause it to shrink and just blend it to where it becomes very, very coarse. Gradually okay. blend in four or five tablespoons of water. Just about to where I can mix it with my hands and I always have to get my hands in here and mix it up so that I can feel. Because when you work with pie dough and you work with it very much, you can feel the fact that, that you have enough liquid in it when it starts to mix together to get to the point where you don't need any more and it has the, it forms into a ball and you'll be able to get all of that all out of your pan, roll it like this, because if you roll it across, it's gonna make it thinner on one side than the other. And I usually turn mine over two or three times and that way I, be sure that it's rolled right. And when you get ready to, after you finish rolling it and put it in your pie plate, you take your pie plate and turn it over like this and be sure that it's large enough. We have a lot of people that are new cooks that do not realize that when you're making a pecan pie or any pie that bakes in the shell, you do not pick or prick the crust like you do on a lemon pie or a chocolate pie, that you pre, uh, pre bake your crust. Because if you do, the pie will come up between that and you'll have a mess of the pecan pie. I think that's fine. 
and we fold it over like this, like this, it makes it easier. Now, if it breaks like this, don't worry about it because you can stick your hands in a little water, and go back and patch it up. But you push it also back up against here so that you have a nice crust on it here. And fold it on around and I flute it like this. And then just kind of turn it around. When the fluting is complete, set the pie crust aside and make the filling. Here are the ingredients. Be sure you get it mixed up real good. It has a nice caramel look to it. Then you add your pecans. Bake at 375 degrees for one hour. And when you get it in there, kind of just turn your pecans around a little bit. You don't have to get them any particular order because they're going to form and make it. And there you are. You have your pecan pie ready for the oven. Let the pie cool at least 25 minutes before slicing. Explore the excitement of more American cooking next time. These dishes, compliments of Bradley Ogden, Gert Rausch, Mary Sue Milligan, and Susan Feniger, some more great chefs of the West. For the 240-page hardbound companion cookbook to the great chefs of the West, send a check for 1990 to Great Chefs, 309 Bourbon, New Orleans, Louisiana, 70130 or use Visa or MasterCard by calling toll-free 1-800-451-WEST. Please have your card number ready when you call. There's a road headed to the west, and it's calling me back again. There's a pale blue sky and a north sunset and a place I can't forget. You go down home when the sun goes low. Head off the highway to the painted western sky. Walk down a worn path through the back door. Cooking in the kitchen and the kettle is warm. Then you sit down, 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 down. Home. Great Chefs of the West, brought to you in part by True Value Hardware and Weber, makers of charcoal grills, gas grills, and fire spice natural cooking woods. True Value and Weber salute Western chefs, masters in the art of natural wood barbecuing. For more than 75 years, Crisco Shortening has helped provide good foods for your family. The beginning of classic Southwestern cooking, all vegetable, no cholesterol Crisco, proudly salutes the great chefs and foods of the West. You're watching KTCA-TV, St. Paul, Minneapolis, Channel 2. Sesame Street is brought to you locally by the Sven and C. Emil Berglund Foundation. The Lund Food Stores of the Twin Cities area. Target Stores, meeting the shopping needs of Minnesota families for 25 years. Bellini Children's Designer Furniture, located in the Yorkdale Shops in Edina. Furniture designed to last from crib to college. The New Horizons Child Care Centers, where love and learning grow. And by Minnesota's dairy farmers and all the healthful products they provide.